The story of the railway in Canada is one of courage and achievement, but it is also one of tragedy and heartbreak. In the Rocky Mountains, the railway exposes mankind to the destructive powers of nature. November 7th, 1885. In the mountains of British Columbia, a single railway spike is hammered home. For the first time, Canada is truly one nation, linked from sea to sea by ribbons of steel. With the driving of the last spike, Canada's railway builders fulfill a promise made to British Columbia in 1871. And at that time, British Columbia was only going to enter Confederation if a railway was completed right from coast to coast. So um, uh, the construction proceeded. It started in the west and it started in the east and slowly, slowly inched its way across the continent to meet basically um, in the, near the Selkirk Mountains. Over 3,700 meters high, the Selkirk stand as the last great barrier to the Canadian Pacific Railway's push to the west coast. Railway construction through the Rogers Pass was some of the most difficult construction. The terrain was a big part of it, the steep hills and the uh, deep valleys and the snowfall. Rogers Pass receives an average of 35 to 50 feet of snow in a winter and of course this impeded their efforts to build. The accumulating snow in the pass leads to an even greater problem, one with often disastrous results. If uh, it thawed and froze and thawed and froze and had rain on top of that, that would create a, a lot more hazard. Uh, and the men were aware of this. They worked in fear of avalanches. At the turn of the century, they had no avalanche control as such. They had to keep this uh, main line open. Uh, and to do that, they built snowsheds. That was their only defense against avalanches was to build snowsheds. If an avalanche comes down over top of it, it would just slide right over top and not interrupt train flow. Throughout the pass, snow clearing is a constant battle. The rotary snow plow makes the job easier, but does nothing to lessen the risk. Right from the very first week of construction in Rogers Pass, when two men were killed, um, right through the whole history of of the railway presence in Rogers Pass. Avalanches were frequent and deaths were frequent. February 1910. Winter has been especially severe in the Selkirk Mountains. By the end of February, storms give way to warmer temperatures, but they only make the pass more volatile. The weather had warmed up and rain had been falling in the area, and these are as we know today, uh, definite warning signs uh, of avalanche potential. This is a classic uh, situation for avalanche events to occur. On March 4th, the CPR's westbound Pacific Express narrowly escapes a devastating fate in Rogers Pass. A blizzard has been raging all day. The engineer spots an avalanche high in the mountains and opens the throttle. He clears the slide by less than 100 meters. While the passenger train waits out the storm at a nearby station, another major slide comes down Mount Cheops near the summit of Rogers Pass, blocking the main line under six meters of snow. It was severe enough that it closed down the track. There was, at that point, apparently a passenger train uh, stranded east of the, of the, the first slide. And uh, it was just general company policy whenever there was a slide to clear it as soon as possible. The job falls to CPR Roadmaster John Anderson. 
Winter storms over the past few weeks have been the worst he has ever seen. There has been little sleep for him and his crew as they work to clear the snow-covered track along Rogers Pass. On this particular occasion, he'd been working with his crew all day long, and then another slide came down at the summit of Rogers Pass and buried the track some 20 feet deep. So he called out the crew, and off they went to clear this particular slide. John Anderson arrives at dusk with a clearing crew of 63 men, including his younger brother, Charles. Uh, word was sent to the snowplow crew to come out to the site and start clearing the avalanche. Conductor Richard Buckley is there too. He has just applied for a leave of absence and plans to reconcile with his wife after a 15-year separation. Tonight, he is in charge of the big rotary snowplow. The rotary plow was powered by a locomotive boiler. It would have had a crew of an engineer and a, a fireman on it. The boiler powered the big rotary blade at the front and it rotated and there would have been a blower where the snow escaped as the plow was cutting through the snow. Engineer William Phillips is at the helm of the locomotive pushing the plow. Fireman Bill Lachance stokes the furnace. We went up there and we bucked right into the snow slide, you know. But it was a messy place because it was full of timber. The slide that come down brought timber and everything with it. Everything cleaned the hill right off, you know. It must have run for over a mile down the hill. Lanterns and the plow's huge headlamp light the way as the rotary cuts a trench six meters deep. Trees, rocks, and other debris make the process a slow one. They were having trouble using the rotary plow, which every time it would count, encounter a tree would break down. So the only option they had was, was to have a, a crew of shovelers in the cut, and they could feed snow into the rotary plow, and it could be, it could be blown out that way. Throughout the long evening, the shoveling crew alternates with the plow, waiting for it to cut through what snow it can, then moving into the deep trench to clear out debris. At 11.30 p.m., John Anderson prepares to leave the site to walk to the watchman's shack 450 meters away. As a roadmaster, he had to report every couple of hours to let the dispatcher know how soon the, the tracks would be cleared. And they'd been working so hard that uh, he'd forgotten to phone in his report. As John Anderson passes the trench, the shoveling crew is going back in. One of them is John's younger brother, Charles. Another is Fritz Wellander, who just came back to work that morning. He'd just been married just a few days before, and he and his bride had gone on a honeymoon, and he'd come back, and instead of taking an extra day off, he'd gone out to join the crew. The work site is a din of noise. But outside the trench, rich carpenter Duncan McRae hears something else, far away at first, but getting closer. I heard a crack. The noise of steam from the rotary, the wildness of the storm, made me feel uncertain about it. Then I heard trees cracking above us and knew the worst. The huge mass of snow and ice races down Mount Avalanche. It bulldozes its way through the heavy forest on the lower slopes, taking the broken timber with it. Avalanches on average travel in, in the area of, say, 70 to 100 kilometers an hour. In extreme cases, uh, they've been observed to travel at speeds in excess of 300 kilometers an hour. I don't think they really heard it coming upon them, so they were really overwhelmed by it. March 4th, 1910. In Rogers Pass, the CPR crew working to clear an avalanche has no idea of what is raging towards them. Outside the trench, bridge carpenter Duncan McRae has heard it coming. 
He tries to run, but the deep snow makes it almost impossible. A blast of wind scoops him up and hurls him into Snowshed 17. The wind blast associated with avalanches is in fact quite rare. However, in very large events, you do get an air turbulence wave ahead of the avalanche and the destructive power of, of this uh, air blast is, is quite significant. In the cab of the locomotive, fireman Bill Lachance leans in to stoke the furnace. He jumps back when flames suddenly shoot out of the firebox. Of course, it was only a fraction of a second the smoke come in through across the gangway. It hit me, and it picked me up just as this flame come out of the firebox. Pulled me out twice my length, I guess, the way it fell, and then it had just doubled me all up and rolled me like that. Now, trying to keep rolled up in a ball to, to go with the snow. I don't get one breath because the snow was got packed right tight to my face. And then this pressure come on and things kind of started to stop. He actually was able to, to push himself out from the snow and get his, his head above, above the snow. He uh, tried to, to use his feet to push himself up and then at that point realized that uh, there was something very wrong with, with one of his legs. I just touched the toe of that foot to the snow, the right foot, and it just turned and that knee went right plump down into the snow sideways. And, well, that was that. So he started to, uh, to call for help, but didn't really expect uh, anybody to come because he didn't hear anything. It must have been all happened pretty fast because after I got out, I couldn't hear the engine. The engine should have been blowing a lot of steam, but there was no sound there. Everything was just dead, that's all. Everything was just dead. In a matter of seconds, the landscape at the summit of Rogers Pass has changed completely. For CPR Roadmaster John Anderson, it's like stepping into an alien world. He went back to the watchman's cabin to, to make the call to town and uh, left behind him there were the lights of the engine, the headlight of the engine and the headlamps and lanterns of the men working. Went and made his call and said we're moving right along and then uh, went back and the lights were all gone. No glow from the fireman's box, no headlamp for the rotoring. I just can't begin to imagine what that would have felt like to get back there and have the the quiet, like no sounds of men's voices, no sound of any kind of work being done, and the darkness, and knowing what had happened. Anderson finds the 100-ton rotary plow tossed like a toy on top of Snowshed 17. Smoke and steam rise up through the snow. And he heard a voice answering very faintly over here. And so he trudged through the snow with his lantern, and it was up higher than his waist, and he found Bill a chance. Bill, he saw him coming up with his lantern and said, what happened? Where is everybody? Where, they, where What happened? And Johnny Anderson says to him, oh, Bill, they're, they're all gone. They're just gone. They're, they're all gone. There are some survivors. Duncan McRae emerges from inside Snowshed 17, where he was thrown by the outer edges of the avalanche. John Anderson finds the camp cook in his overturned kitchen car, shaken but uninjured. Together, they move Bill Lachance to safety. Then Anderson calls for help. As soon as the word was received in Revelstoke, they uh, rang the fire bell and they rang uh, as many engines as they could at the station just to alert the town that there was an emergency and to, uh, to call people out. Uh, to respond to it. The whole town knew what was what was um, going on, so people would, you know, grab blankets and 
and shovels and went to the station. They always had a train ready with a steam up, just in case. When rescuers arrive, they are shocked by the scene of utter devastation. More than 150 meters of Snowshed 17 has been torn away, its heavy timber snapped like matchsticks. But what awaits them under the snow is even worse. The early morning hours of March 5th, 1910. Rescuers from the town of Revelstoke have answered a call for help and arrive at the base of Mount Cheops near the summit of Rogers Pass. In the light of dawn, they find the locomotive buried on its side under a bank of snow. Pinned beneath it is the broken body of engineer William Phillips. John Anderson makes a discovery of his own. And he saw a glove sticking out of the snow, and there was a hand inside the glove, and he then cleared away the snow, and, and it was the conductor, I believe his name was Buckley. And he got him out of the snow, but he was, he was very badly injured. I think he was unconscious at the time, and I think he died an hour, an hour or so later. The trench where the shoveling crew had been working is covered with almost 10 meters of snow. The search for bodies must be done by hand. Of course, they couldn't use the rotary to clear, to clear this. It was all done with, with, with shovels. Um, it had to be, to be very slow. Uh, at that point, there was, there, was no, um, there was no thought of any possibility of, of survivors. With the tools they had available at that time, it would have been almost physically impossible to remove somebody from that avalanche deposit in half an hour. That's about what you have available uh, before you suffocate, is around half an hour. As the bodies are uncovered, it becomes apparent just how quickly the avalanche came down. Many, many people were found exactly in the spot that they were when the avalanche hit. There was a, a group of three foremen who were standing up when they were dug out of the snow as if they had just been in the middle of having a chat and one of them was still holding his pipe and another fellow was found with his fingers clutched around paper as if he was about to roll a cigarette. Over the next few days, 58 bodies are brought to the surface. John Anderson's brother Charles is one of them. So is Fritz Wellander, married only a few days earlier. A coroner's inquest convenes to look into the disastrous Rogers Pass avalanche, which has taken the lives of 58 men. The first jury fails to agree on a verdict. The second takes less than an hour to make its decision. The second jury agreed that it was uh, purely accidental, it was an act of God. Uh, there was no, uh, uh, no criminal neglect or no liability on the, the part of the, the Canadian Pacific Railway and um, that their only recommendation was that perhaps crews shouldn't be working during severe storms at night. For John Anderson, the tragedy is more than he can take. Five days after the disaster, he resigns. He gave up a promotion too, I believe. Um, he took a demotion, um, a lower rate of pay because he just didn't want to be in that situation again. But I think my dad was, must have been traumatized because he, he'd lost his young brother. He would feel terrible. He would wonder why he was saved. He liked all the men and every man would be important to him. It would hurt him. Terribly. Despite two broken legs and a host of cuts and bruises, Bill Lachance recovers after a long convalescence. He continues to railroad in the mountains for several years. He had two more train wrecks where his train ended up in the river as a result of rock slides and at that point decided that possibly railroading was not for him. and took a job um, as a barber, actually, and uh, led a, a less exciting life after that. 
The tragedy in the mountains that night has forever changed the rail line's presence in Rogers Pass. The number of fatalities was a contributing factor in, in um, this Canadian Pacific Railway's decision to go underground and build a, a diversion tunnel uh, through the Rogers Pass, uh, this tunnel being the Connaught Tunnel. Um, it was five miles long and went directly under Mount Macdonald and eliminated the need to go up and over the Rogers Pass. I think basically they just conceded defeat. They tried everything that they could think of and really the 1910 disaster was, was just, just too much and it was, it was time for the railway just to leave Rogers Pass and abandon that uh, danger forever. In Canada, the tragedy of Rogers Pass is a testament to the sacrifice of men who helped tie this country together with ribbons of steel. Rogers Pass is a National Historic Site today, commemorating the transportation route in the early railroad, the railroad years. There's a little interpretive sign that's all that marks the place where these 58 men died in the uh, 1910 slide. And people, people are, quite, are quite moved by that, that uh, such, a, such a disaster happened here for so long ago, and so many people that gave their lives in order to, um, to keep transportation moving across Canada was what it came down to.